Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our 73rd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I'm the Dean of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Jean, uh, Genevieve Langdon from the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Genevieve Langdon is Professor of Blast and Impact Engineering. She is trained as a mechanical engineer, completing her undergraduate and doctoral studies at the University of Liverpool. Her PhD work focuses on the response of corrugated blast walls with semi-rigid connections to, glass, to gas explosion loading and was sponsored by the EPSRC, HSE and industry. She is a chartered engineer and member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. She is also a member of the British Society for Strain Measurement. Genevieve joined the department in 2020 after spending 15 years working in Cape Town as an academic. She gained first-hand experience in explosion testing there and was director of the Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit for five years. She is currently an honorary professor at the University of Cape Town. Genevieve's research is concerned with the response and failure of structures and materials subjected to explosion loading and other extreme loading conditions. She takes a multidisciplinary approach to understanding this multifaceted problem and is interested in every aspect of the blast event chain. Her work uses modern instrumentation techniques in carefully controlled experiments to elucidate understanding of the material and structural behavior. Although primarily experimental, her work involves a mix of lab scale physical testing, material characterization experiments, analytical work and computational simulations. This involves fundamental experimental and applied research projects. Her goal is to make the world a safer place by mitigating the harmful and devastating effects of explosions on people, equipment and infrastructure. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Genevieve Langdon from the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom on a brief tour through the response of fiber reinforced polymer composites to blast loading. Professor Genevieve Langdon, over to you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you for your very warm welcome. I'm greatly honored to be invited to your distinguished lecture series, and I just hope I can live up to your expectations. So I'm just sharing my screen now. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, before I speak to you today, I just want to acknowledge some of my long-suffering collaborators, Professor Chris von Klemperer from the University of Cape Town and Professor Wesley Campwell at Khalifa University, as well as your very own Professor Yaza Jaya, uh, who, who works at UTM, as well as the many students I've worked with over the years on this topic. Um, the Blast and Impact Group at the University of Sheffield are one of the, the UK leading universities, particularly in the area of blast research. We have experimental facilities that look at the study of high effects of high explosives on structures, so detonating high explosives such as um, PE4 and TNT. Uh, the, text, the test site is in um, Yorkshire, which is in the middle of the UK, if you look at the map. Um, we're able to detonate up to a few kilograms of TNT equivalent. And we have high-speed cameras, um, uh, characterization of blast loading facility, pressure instrumentation and similar other instrumentation to help us understand the blast event completely. And my, my part in the team is to add on to that to look at the structural response. Um, at the moment in the UK, we're, we're in November now, so we're heading into the winter. So the test site doesn't look quite as pretty as it does in the photograph on the screen. Uh, but if you're ever in the UK, very warm welcome to come in and visit the University of Sheffield and talk to me in person if you want to learn more about blast loading. So today we're here to talk about FRPs. FRPs are composite materials that have a polymer matrix which is reinforced with some sort of fiber. The material properties of these sorts of composites are influenced by many different aspects of the composite makeup. This includes the fiber type, whether it's glass or carbon, um, which are probably the two you've heard of most, or the polymer resin type, such as epoxy or polyester. Uh, the way that the, the fibers are weaved together, whether they're all laid in one direction or whether they're woven across each other, 
how they're manufactured and how you stack the different layers of material all affect their response. On your screen, you can see two photographs. The one on the left is a picture of um, a graphite epoxy FRP, where you can see the graphite fiber on the end, up from the end on um, at very high magnification. And on the right-hand side, you can see a cross-section photograph of something called Dyneema, which is an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, this material is a very exciting prospect for the defense industry. Um, you can see um, in the image, you can see the, the fibers are, are stacked in layers. You can see a white area and then an, an alternating darkish area. The whitish layer with the circles show you the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fibers from the end on. The darker layer shows the fibers running from left to right at 90 degrees to the end on view. In both of the images, you can see that the fibers are not uniformly spaced out. They do tend to come together. Um, although when we model them, we assume that um, they are uniformly spaced out. So why would materials like this be so useful to us? Well, fiber reinforced polymers have a wide range of structural applications because they have very high specific stiffness, which means that their stiffness compared to their weight is very high and high specific strength. And they also have other useful properties. And on your screen now, you can see uh, two potential applications which are actually out there in, in the world. One of them is a Visby Corbett that has a carbon fiber sandwich hull, which has a very high specific strength and stiffness, but they're also taking um, advantage of the fact that they're not using metal, so its radar cross section is very low. On the right hand side, you can see their little Mercedes car. Uh, these use natural fibers um, for sustainability reasons in certain aspects of the internal part of the car. Now, natural fibers are not very strong, so this means that they're only really suitable for low strength parts. So you can see everything from a very low strength but quite bulky application in a Mercedes all the way up to sort of a very high um, technical application in the defense industry. And FRPs can be used for both extremes and everything in between. And the reason they're so useful is that you can tailor the properties by alternating the materials, changing the way that you, you install them, um, altering the manufacturing processes and um, making sure that the fibers are aligned with the with the directions in which they're likely to experience high loading, so, which makes them extremely versatile and very, very useful. Now, in, in our world today, some structures are designed to withstand blast loads, such as landmine protected vehicles, because they operate in those sorts of conditions where they might experience an explosion, such as in demining or in peacekeeping and defense operations. But other structures like the Mercedes were designed without any consideration of blast loading. Now on the screen, we, you can see there is a recent image from a paper that we've just published looking at the strength of the Beirut explosion. And unfortunately today, the threat of terrorism and industrial accidents, such as the terrible accident in Beirut, um, cause us to think about the fact that all materials, whether they were designed for it or not, could be subjected to an explosion load. So even low strength materials are materials that we should be trying to gain an awareness of how they would respond in such a devastating event, such as an explosion like this, not just the high strength um, polymers that you might use in the defense in industry. So a large chunk of my career has been looking at these sorts of materials and how they respond under explosions. And so the rest of the talk today will focus on um, some of the experiments that I've done over the years and some of the insights that I've gained. So hence the name, the brief tour. Um, the easiest way to talk about these things is to show you actual photographs of um, some of the test pieces that we've tested. So on your screen at the moment, you can see a typical glass fiber epoxy composite. And um, this is a very commonly used FRP used in all sorts of applications everywhere. This particular panel has 21 layers of woven glass fiber. It's 200 millimeters in diameter, and it was loaded by taking a small disc of plastic explosive number four, which is very similar to C4, which is the one you often see on the movies in those uh, truck bombs uh, that are gonna blow up the whole of New York or Washington. Um, and, and we load this uh, uh, um, very close into the panel. So it's a very localized type of loading. You'll see on the screen a Z number. Now, if you've not seen a Z number before, what Z does is it gives us an idea of how close the explosive is to the panel. So it's a scaled type of distance. So if you have 
Um, a Z number that's less than one, you've got explosive that's extremely close to the panel and we call that near field loading. If Z is greater than one, then we have something called far field loading. Um, and that is usually more uniform and has lower pressures than these localized blasts. So most of my work is focused on the more um, localized extreme types of loading that you see from near field, which is a more worst case um, condition for a fiber reinforced polymer that tends to be weak in shear and quite brittle. If you're new to FRPs, they differ significantly from materials like steel and aluminium because they have very little plastic capacity. And what that means is that they're brittle materials and that they will behave in an almost linear elastic way where the stress and strain uh, will increase linearly. So stress increases linearly with strain until they get to the point where they fail. And then they fail in a brittle way, in, usually through cracking or matrix damage or something like that, or multiples of these kinds of failure modes. And that's what you can see on the screen here. So the dark areas around the outsides of those two uh, figures A and B, which are at the top of the screen, are what the material would have looked like before it was blast loaded. And you can see that all of the part inside the circle has gone white. It's gone white because it's delaminated. So what's happened is that there's been um, a breaking of the bonds between the layers of the fibers. And that causes the whiteness that you can see on the screen. And on the left-hand image with the higher Z value, which means um, that it's got slightly less explosive loaded to, with it, um, you, you can see this, everything is white. And on the right-hand image where the Z value is slightly lower, which means it's actually been tested at a slightly higher charge mass, you can see this area in the middle has gone even more white. You've got a diamond. And inside that diamond, you've got fiber rupture. So that panel is no longer going to sustain any loading. And if you take a look at the image um, on the bottom of your screen, what we've done there is we've taken one of those panels, we've cut it in half, and we're showing you the cross section. And you can see how the, the um, layers of material within the, within the composites have come apart. And you can see the gaps, which indicate delamination, where th that image is showing the blast would have come from the bottom upwards. So what you're seeing is on the tensile side of the structure, if this was purely underbending, you're seeing that's where the fibre fracture initiates. So the material gets to a point where its capacity um, to deform is gone and it breaks if the fibres rupture. And eventually, if you keep loading this type of material, it will rupture all the way through the cross section and then we'll just let the explosion through, which can be very devastating if you're using that as a protective material. Uh, here are some other typical photographs of failures. This particular material is an S2 glass with a phenolic resin and it's very thick material. Um, S2 glass is a stronger type of glass fiber than the one you saw on the other screen, which was E glass. And the dimensions of this panel are slightly larger. In this case, the clamp frame was square uh, rather than circular. Um, and because the material is um, opaque, you can't see the whitening that comes from delamination. But what you can see on the screen are some of the other typical material failure loads. So this is the same panel. The image on the left is showing you the loaded side and the image on the right is showing you the rear side. So in the image on the left, you can see localized buckling. There's some delamination with a little bit of whitening uh, from the kind of orangey color that you should see this panel to be. You've got fiber rupture and some material loss in the center due to the fact that this loading is extremely localized. <clears throat> The boundary conditions for fiber reinforced composites in blast tests uh, have a big influence on the response. If you clamp a material like this too tight in a square frame, then what you'll get is the panel will start to indent into the frame and that will cause a premature and unrealistic failure mode at the edges. So one of the things we can do is change the boundary conditions to prevent this. So in this set of experiments, and maybe this is a good time to illustrate how we do these tests, is we would typically clamp the specimen inside a clamp frame, which is shown on the far left of the image. Uh, you can see a sort of purple clamp frame and a white panel inside it. And then that is typically attached to something. In this particular experiment, it's attached to a ballistic pendulum. So you detonate some explosives near the front of the panel. The, the panel transfers that momentum through the pendulum. The pendulum will then um, give you an impulse reading because you can measure the swing of it and the panel itself gets damaged by the explosion and you're able to then do very careful post-test analysis of those panels. And here's a, an example from 
uh, again, this is a, a glass fiber panel. And you can see here that um, in this particular test, rather than clamping it tight around the edge of the circle, what we did was just put four bolts around the corners to have a look at how that changed things. And we were able to get rid of the premature indentation failure. But what it did do is you see the delamination failure goes far beyond the boundary, um, which perhaps is to be expected as the material deforms outwards. And in the center region there, you see extensive fiber fracture. Fiber reinforced composites are also very sensitive to load distribution. A highly localized load will produce a very um, localized rupture, a hole through the center of the panel. And this is showing now our glass fiber um, polypropylene um, thermoplast, which is a thermoplastic. So with a thermoplastic, which has a lower melting point than say um, epoxy wood, you, you see um, more damage to the resin occurring as well. So if you look at the, the two images on your screen, the one on the, the both of them have been um, tested at the same charge mass, 20 grams, but they have different standoff distances, which is the distance between the explosive charge and the target face itself. So the image on the left-hand side, uh, the explosive was 38 millimeters away from the panel, whereas on the right-hand side, it was 50 millimeters away. And you can see here that a very small change, just a few millimeters, can make a big difference to whether or not this panel survives. Uh, there's also localized melting on the matrix of the matrix on the front face. You can see that on the image on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, this is quite typical of locally loaded uh, fiber reinforced polymers and a small amount of explosive. So it's not just how much explosive that a terrorist use, it's where they put the explosives that makes the difference, particularly so with a fiber reinforced polymer panel. Just to illustrate that a little bit further, we just saw um, some images of panels where the explosive was very uh, close to the target. In these tests, the explosive has been put further away at 20 mill 200 millimeters away instead of 50 millimeters away. And in these tests, we can see that uh, you don't get any localized damage in the center of the panel anymore because the panel has been subjected to a more uniform load across its front. Here on the left-hand side, we've got um, a panel subjected to 25 grams of PE4. On the right-hand side, a panel subjected to 15 grams of PE4. And you see the front face on one and the back face on the other. Um, and even though these are both still um, near field tests because the Z value is below one, it's, a, it's approaching the far field a pressure time history. So it would have been loaded for a longer time and over more of the area of the panel. We see far less fiber fracture. We see some of the failures along the clamped boundary that I was talking about before. Uh, so instead of having the failure in the middle of the panel, like you do for a very localized test, with a small standoff distance, you're then getting these more uniform failures across the panel. So I suppose the lesson here is if you want to use fiber reinforced polymers in um, structures that might be um, subjected to a blast load, if you can get some distance between the explosive and the structure, your fiber reinforced polymers are going to survive a lot better because they won't be subjected to these very localized failures of fiber fracture in the center where the explosion happens. And um, they will be able to have more of the panel material involved in resisting the blast. So here we have Professor Yazajaya's PhD study. And what we looked at here were some near field experiments and looking at the response of glass fiber versus carbon fiber for uh, PEI. Um, these were experiments that contributed to Yazid's PhD. And what we can see here is that if you test different thicknesses of composite materials, which is in the graph you see there, we looked at thicknesses from two millimeters up to 12 millimeters. And then the impulse is a measure for the size of the charge. How big was the explosion? We can see here that um, these are the points at which we would get some failure. So what we can see is that um, the uh, black circles are the carbon panels, the open circles are the glass panels, and you can see there that the circles indicating complete failure, we, we were able, if you look at the four millimeter ones, you can see that the glass fiber panels 
survive the blast much better than the carbon fiber panels. And this has been quite a controversial point in the literature and uh, Yazad's PhD uh, contributed greatly to our understanding of the fact that glass fiber uh, was uh, more blast resistant than carbon fiber in many applications. And that's probably due to its increased ductility, um, whereas carbon tends to be slightly more brittle. Um, just out of interest, glass is also better than Kevlar. Um, so here are some other images from Yazid's PhD, where we looked at how much fracture do you get? Um, so he looked at the length of the fracture in the fiber um, all, and then looking at the increasing size of the blast on the horizontal axis for some different laminates. Um, it's quite difficult here to see um, any influence of the resin system itself. We looked at panels that had PEI, like we did on the previous image versus epoxy resin. And um, the, you, you can't really see much uh, from that. And the reason for that is that the fiber usually dominates over the resin in blast response. Uh, particularly for the stronger fibers such as carbon and glass um, and ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Where your fibers are weaker, like say in a natural fiber, then you would see the resin contributing more to the blast resistance. And on the right hand side of this screen, you can see an image here of one of uh, Yazid's experiments where we tested it with, with a circular um, exposed area and clamped it around the edges. So the holes you see are for the clamping frame. And what we see here is a very beautiful example of shear around that boundary edge where the panel is coming completely out. But you also have cracking in the middle, which makes this an extremely interesting failure mode because the Z value is in between this localized and uniform um, area. So you would have had a displacement of the panel overall, cracking in the center and then shearing around the boundary, causing almost that entire disc to come out as one piece. Um, the elastic brittle nature of FRPs means that the post-test deformations are very small, even though the failures are massive. And this is because they lack plastic energy capacity. Um, however, one thing it does mean is that uh, just looking at the final the form shape of the structure, it will tell you very little about its overall transient response. So you don't know what its maximum deflection will be. So uh, we were able to do some work with partners from um, Australia who supplied the panels. And when I was at Cape Town, we did these experiments quite recently where we looked at um, S2 glass fiber uh, and we subjected it to quite near field loading, uh, quite extreme loads, uh, 40, 50 and 60 grams, all shown on this picture. And what you can see here is the midpoint displacement against time. So you can see that it starts off at zero. It goes up to a peak and that the peak increases with increasing displacement, which you may expect. And then you get this rapid uh, rebound afterwards. And then by the time you get to about six or seven milliseconds, you have deformed in the opposite direction to the explosion, which is a very, very interesting thing. So um, what this means is that the transient risk displacements are much larger than the permanent response. And you can also get very high peak negative displacements in the opposite direction to the explosion. And the reason for that is something called reverse snap buckling, which is a feature in materials with high elasticity um, and uh, is the reason why looking at transient response in a fiber reinforced polymer is so important because the transient displacements can be up to 10 times, maybe even more, the permanent response. So if we were to look at those same panels now, but we change the, the um, standoff distance, make it lower, make it more localized, but we reduce the mass of the charge as well then we can get to a position where if you look at the 20 gram pulse, you can see that you get a lower peak displacement in the direction of the blast around 18 millimeters, and then a higher direction, a, a, a higher peak in the opposite direction, which is really interesting. Um, and again, is a, an illustration of this phenomena of, of um, buckling. And then you see that the panel then goes back to um, a reasonable um, post-test permanent deflection of around about eight millimeters. So if you were um, just looking at this panel afterwards, you would have no idea that it had done this very interesting transient response because it just looks like it's deformed a few millimeters and that was it. 
Uh, this is a, a just a material I'd just like to flag as one I believe is one for the future. A lot of work has been done over the years on glass and carbon, but this is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene inside a polyurethane matrix. It's known as Dyneema. And it's really interesting because it's very strong and it's very tough. And um, this is a test we did at 30 grams um, at 50 millimeters away. Um, you can see all sorts of interesting failure modes in this panel. You get some of that um, reverse um, displacement I was talking about earlier, if you look at the side on view on the right hand side. So you get some snap through buckling. You see a large permanent deflection of the panel. There's a small perforated region in the center, um, which virtually closes over when you rebound. Um, there's tensile stretching, necking, fibrillation, broken fibers. There's an awful lot going on that makes this a very complex failure mode to understand, but it is a very promising material for the future. So I think that if you are someone who's looking at FRPs, this is a material that a lot of people are interested in right now. And I think we'll see more and more papers coming out on this over the years. So where is this get journey going? I realize that we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to recap on some of the lessons um, that I've learned over the years. Um, Multiple and complex failure modes are present in fiber reinforced polymer structures under blast loads. And I think you've seen quite a lot of photographs of different panels subjected to blast loading. Um, experiments are designed to support modeling. So what we can do in experiments is identify key failure types and provide validation data. Um, it doesn't always represent a full scale real life application in every detail. And one of the particular areas that are difficult there are how you fix the conditions of the panel at the boundaries, uh, which is uh, quite difficult to replicate in an experiment. Uh, so what that means is that we need to model the actual boundary conditions used in our experiments so we can subtract that away from the material response and get to what's really important. Uh, fiber reinforced polymers are much better under uniformly distributed loads as localized loads and particularly contact explosions where the explosive is in contact with the material are devastating in an FRP. The transient response is really important in a, in a material, particularly with a lot of elasticity, such as an FRP. Fiber strength and stiffness tend to dominate over the resin properties uh, with glass fiber being better than carbon fiber and those are better than natural fibers. But resin systems can improve the fiber matrix bond, and so those can be advantageous. Uh, woven fibers tend to be better than more damage and um, more damage tolerant than uni um, unidirectional systems. And there's a lot of potential to optimize stacking and weave geometry. And new developments such as Dyneema, they hold a lot of potential for uh, the defense community. Um, some challenges that we face in fiber reinforced polymer research um, are trying to characterize the failure modes um, and uh, understand how to formulate the material so that we can model them. This is particularly difficult for fracture. And um, so what you see on the screen there is a, an attempt at a single leg bend test, done at, which we try to do at high speed. Um, to try and characterize the opening of the, of the fracture in a composite material, which has, um, has a two parts with a crack already initiated in it. Um, interpreting experimental data from all of the new measurement technologies that are coming on board now, which includes camera systems and digital image correlation and other um, imaging technologies, which are um, pyrometers, et cetera, which are coming on board. These are now all quite reasonably priced and uh, it allows experimental measurement technology to catch up with computational resolution. But trying to interpret that data um, is a, a challenge and a challenge in every field as data increases. Um, near field and contact loads are not well understood either on the loading side or the response part. And because FRPs are so sensitive to these, it's a real challenge for design and materials uh, for the future. And then the one that we've done very little about in, um, in this type of research field is post blast strength. So some structures might need to continue to function after an explosion. Um, how do we measure that or predict it? And what would be a good proxy? Would um, bend strength afterwards or compression after impact be a good um, indicator? We don't know. 
And so those are some of the challenges that I am mentally wrestling with at the moment. And if you have any comments on those, I would be very grateful. Uh, this is just a few of the key references. It's not an exhaustive list of some of the papers that I've referred to in the talk today. Um, and with that, I will say thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Um, and I will hand back over to, I think, Professor Yazid. Thank you. Prof, Prof Yazid, you need to unmute. Prof, Prof Yazid, we cannot hear you. Oh dear, it looks like um, Professor Yezid is having difficulty with the microphone. <laughs> okay, it looks like he's going to try and rejoin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can hear you now. Uh, hi, Prof. <laughs> oh, yes, it, it is very yes, nice yes, to yes, see you yes, again. yes. Long time to see you. Okay. Um. So you remember me? I do. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> so I remember 2006? I think on February 2006, we first met in University of Cape Town. Okay. And then. Uh, you helped me for blast test, doing blast testing. Without your help, I think I won't get my PhD. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so, okay. Um, and we so were we, papers together. We're not op uh, open for the question and answer. Okay, from Dr. Ali Farukinijat. Okay, postdoc in UTM. Okay, the question is, we know that slide change in SOD, stand of distance, will affect on the response of structures. So can we define any precise definition about close range exposures and far field exposure? Okay, question number two, what is your opinion about using hybrid FRP composite plus metallic wire mesh? Regarding the wire mesh um, and polymer can be elongate very much. This is our, our new project of can okay. you uh, explain? Okay, so those those Z values that you saw on the screen are something called Hopkinson grand scale distance. Give a um, a sort of a more precise definition about what represents a far field than a near field explosion. So, in general, a far field explosion is where you have a Hopkinson grand scale distance of greater than one. A, then you have then you have two ranges. Then you have the range within which the fireball is still active. So if you've looked at any of the videos of blast on this online, you will have seen a fireball and then you will have seen a shockwave move out from the fireball. The area over which the fireball is still um, interacting greatly that is very, very near field. And then there's a range between very near field and far field which where these two effects sort of both occur and it's much more complicated. So that is the precise definition of our close range and far field is, is rooted in this definition of Hopkinson grand scale distance, which if you just put Hopkinson grand scale distance into Google, you will find a ton of information about. Um, so it's basically a scale distance. So what you do is you look at the charge um, itself and you look at, at the cubic root of that you've got the standoff distance, and so the ratio of the two is going to give you a scale distance, which relates the standoff distance to the explosive size. Uh, the second question, hybrid fiber reinforced polymer composites and metallic wire meshes. Um, 
I have not used the two together um, purely because I've never been, had the facilities to make them. So my view on them would be that I think they would have potential. Um, you might have some issues with bonding them together. Uh, so that might, I can, the only issue I can really see is in the manufacturer. Uh, you're going to have a big mismatch between the Young's modulus of the resin and the Young's modulus of the fiber wires, the wire itself, if you're making the wires out of, say, steel or aluminium. And I don't know whether that's going to cause you issues in everyday service because of the thermal expansion of one, because of the amount at which they will both strain and stress differently. Um, but I do think that wire meshes may well have great potential because the wire itself is going to have really good energy absorption, really good ductility, but the resin that you're putting it inside of might not. And so you'll probably get a lot more resin failures, but the wire mesh itself might stay in one piece. So that's just a, a couple of, of thoughts on that. Um, I hope that was helpful. It sounds like a very okay. interesting project. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, the, the wire mesh, like fiber metal laminate, the, the, the idea, but yeah. reduce the weight, uh, actually. So this is our current, current research. Okay. okay. Maybe, like uh, fiber metal laminates are, have been really interesting, and the biggest problem with them has been trying to get the bond between the metal layer and the composite layer, right? Uh -huh, okay, okay. Okay, the second question is from uh, Kanan Perumal. Okay, hi, Prof. Any comment on the aircraft crash followed by the blast and the collapse of the Twin Tower of NYC? <laughs> yeah. I haven't studied the Twin Towers, so any comment that I did make would be a non-expert. Uh, what I can say is that um, the steel columns in the buildings of the Twin Towers, it is feasible that the gas ignition uh, from the fuel of the aircraft could have heated up those columns. When you heat up steel, it does reduce in strength and it is possible that you could then get a progressive collapse. So if you have locally heated the columns at a point and you've got a significant mass above it, it's possible that you then buckle at that point and then the impact of that buckle could then cause another buckle and you get a progressive collapse similar to the way that if you crush a coke can you get those folds and um, that's the only comment i'm going to make i don't know any more about it i know there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there about who was responsible and whether the the explosion was um pre there and whether it was even caused by the planes i don't know but you do have this potential of it suffered an impact there's a lot of heating due to all of that uh, fuel igniting. And so you do have potential conditions for a progressive collapse. That's all I can say. Thank you. So I, I, I saw your res new research about the luggage container. Can you elaborate this? On which one? For the blast test? Yeah. Luggage container. Oh, the luggage container. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening there is that... Um, we tried to scale down a unit load device, uh, which uh, you see a lot of these. Uh, if you have ever gone on an aircraft, your luggage goes into one of these unit load devices, which are sort of look like squares with the di with a with one of the corners cut off. With, so you've got a diagonal, and they go inside the bottom of the hull on the aircraft. And the 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 idea of the research was to have a look at venting to see if instead of having all of the walls solid if one of the walls was was open <clears throat> how would that affect the peak um loading and displacement of that luggage container so that you don't have that moving into the primary framework of the of the aircraft um and so we we did some experiments there and we found um that we could measure some of the transient response of of that diagonal face. We kept all of the others rigid to really simplify the experiment down so that we were looking just at geometry effects and the effect of venting. And then we modeled that as well. And uh, at the time we weren't able to use pressure transducers in the rig at Cape Town, but we were able to look at the pressure and how it behaved from the numerical model because we've been able to uh, validate the model by looking at the displacements. Um, and so that was a nice example of how you can use modeling and experiments together if you don't if you can't measure everything you'd like to in 
in the experiment, you can use the modeling to help you gain insight into some of those places where you can't quite get to yet. Uh, what is the effect of in-plane and out-of-plane damage evolution characterizations? Mm -hmm. What is the effect of in-plane and out-of-plane damage evolution characterization in FRP subjected to blast loading? Okay. When the shape of explosive is changed, can we compare the experimental result based on the Z scale distance? Okay. Question number three. If the stress wave propagation is a type of matrix is higher than fiber, so can we conclude the damage dominated by matrix? So. Okay. So what is the effect of in-plane and out-of-plane damage evolution characterizations in FRP subject to... Um, I'm not really sure exactly what the question refers to. Um, <clears throat> most of the damage, so I've looked at the damage in a couple of ways. So the, the outer plane deformation of the plate, which is that mid plate, midpoint displacement time history type response, and we've looked at quite a lot. The in-plane damage, which is due to um, the uh, stress propagation outwards from the location of the blast interacting with the panel, uh, you can see in the delamination. So what you see is that they, there's a very complex interaction between all of those different types of failing modes with delamination and debonding, um, fiber uh, matrix cracking, uh, fiber rupture. And it depends a lot on the very precisely on the load type, the boundary conditions, the manufacturing type. So it, it's impossible to generalize without actually doing some sort of experimentation or some sort of modeling to look at it. Uh, what is really difficult though, is to work out what those, um, what the material model in the model should look like to characterize accurately the in-plane and outer plane damage evolution. Um, so there's a, there's, it's an impossible question to answer because it's kind of everything, if you get what I mean. Um, let me try the second one and maybe I can be slightly more useful there. When the shape of explosives is changed, can we compare the experimental results based on Z? Um, <clears throat> um, yes and no. So uh, Z is a useful indicator. Um, Z is mostly used for spherical explosions and it has been used for um, cylindrical charges as well. Um, but with s charges which are cylindrical, say, instead of spherical, where you're getting different, um, the different shape means you're going to get a different shock profile um, along the longitudinal axis direction and uh, laterally, you would have a different shock profile. So you would not, I would not feel 100% comfortable just um, comparing different shapes with different sets. I would be happy to say, here is my shape of explosive, here is my target oriented to that explosive shape, and then to change the Z without changing that um, explosive shape. But I wouldn't be happy to say the Z for a cylinder and the Z for a sphere and the Z for a some other shape would all be, would, would all be mutually uh, comparable. It's not quite as straightforward as that because of the difference in the shock profile due to the change in the explosive shape. Um, if the stress wave propagation in a type of matrix is higher than the fiber, can we conclude the damage dominated by the matrix? Uh, what, you, what you can conclude is that the stress waves will propagate more quickly in the matrix if that was indeed the case. Um, but I have mostly seen the case where the stress waves propagate more quickly in the fibers than they do in the matrix. And um, what that can do is it can create some quite interesting um, uh, delamination shapes. So we saw this in the fi in fiber metal laminates, which are hybrid materials where you have stacks of, of uh, thin metal layers with fiber reinforced polymers in between. I had panels where the fibers were glass, they were glass fiber, uh, and they were glass fiber in a polypropylene matrix. They were laid up at 0, 90 to each other, uh, sort of that in that direction. The weave was 0, 90, and that was parallel to the edges of the panel. When we tried 
uh, shifting the fibers so that they were plus minus 45 degrees to the edges of the panels instead of 0, 90, we were able to shift the orientation of the damage, which had typically been in a diamond shape. Uh, we were able to shift that through 45 degrees as well because the de debonding de of the outer layer of the metal was affected by the stress wave propagation through the fiber matrix, which was a really interesting result. So the stress wave propagation through the, through the fiber is generally more dominating than through the matrix. The matrix is gonna get badly damaged whatever we do because the matrix is almost always gonna be weaker than the fiber itself unless you're talking about natural fibers, in which case then um, the matrix does play a bigger part. I hope that was helpful, I mean. Uh, yes. Professor Nasir, Nasir. Nasir. Uh, mechanism observed during blast loading is similar with those under quasi-static loading, delamination, fiber fracture, extra, extra. Is there a preference of specific mechanism under blast with respect to the high strain rate? Uh, I'm sorry, if there a specific mechanism of... Mechanism observed during blast loading is similar to those under quasi-static loading. Oh. Delimination, fiber fracture, and so on. Um, so, under, yeah, under quasi, so there's a, under quasi-static loading, you um, there are a couple of things that, that you don't have that you do have in a blast. So under quasi-static loading, you're applying the load almost statically. Um, you can see some of the same failure modes, but under a blast load, you've got this issue of stress wave com um, propagation. So if you have a layered material, where you have a very weak back layer, such as you might have if you have a metal bonded to an FRP composite. What you would have in a quasi-static test is you would maybe bend that and you would probably see that you would get some sort of in-plane failure between the metal and the composite layers because there's a mismatch in the Young's moduli and the apparent Young's moduli and uh, you're probably going to get the two materials moving apart in in-plane shear. If you do the same thing in a blast experiment, then what you've got, first of all, you've got a compressive stress wave that moves through the composite layer into the, the metal layer and then bounces back as a tensile wave and can spall the back face off. So that's one of the things that you need to look for is this effect of this massive stress wave that propagates through the materials, as well as the lateral ones that are going transversely through the fibers, et cetera. You do have this compressive one that bounces through. And then the second thing that you have in an explosion that you don't have in a quasi-static type of experiment is you have um, strain rate sensitivity of, mater of the material properties. So some materials have high strain rate sensitivity, such as steel. There's some debate about whether glass fiber has um, high rate sensitivity or not. And some materials are very low strain rate sensitivity. Um, so for example, stainless steel has less rate sensitivity than mild steel, but it still has some, um, and some interesting ones depending on the grade of stainless steel. Um, and then you, you see Carbon fiber and glass fiber potentially also have different rate sensitivity effects. Um, and then the third thing that you sometimes get in an explosion, if you're very close in, and it affects fiber reinforced polymers more than it affects steel, is temperature. So if the fiber reinforced polymer is in is in close proximity to the fireball, you can get damage due to the fireball, which you which you would see in the matrix because the matrix is subjected to extra heating. Uh, and you generally don't see that much damage in steel due to the fireball. How many different fracture modes in FRP panel when subjected to uniformly distributed load or non-uniform distributed load? Okay, so um, in a, in a non-uniformly distributed load, you're much more likely to see uh, localized fiber fracture and shearing. Um, in a uniformly distributed load, 
you tend to get those failures located at the boundaries. So it's not so much that you see different fracture modes, it's more that they occur in different places for different reasons. Um, so it, and this would be true in a, in a metal panel as well. If you load it in the center, you're gonna get a cap that flies out due to shearing around the edge of the loading. Whereas if you load it uniformly, it's going to fail at the boundaries because that's the place that's where it's being stopped from moving. Um, in a fiber reinforced polymer, you've got all of that, but much more complex because you've got all these other additional failure modes. And you've got the fact that, that fiber reinforced polymer is probably weaker in shear than, than a material such as steel or aluminium. Uh, Prof. Yazid, you are on mute again. Okay. Uh, I think that is for today. So I would like to thank to your Prof. For Genevieve for your time and for wonderful and knowledgeable sharing. We appreciate it so much. Okay. Thanks also to the audience for listening. Thanks everyone. I hope to see you again in other series of distinguished lectures. I pass it, I pass it. Uh, back to our dean. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, uh, Prof. Yazid. Thank you so much for sharing the session. And uh, but by the way, Prof. Yazid, I really, really think you need to get yourself a new laptop. You know, try for the latest brand. You know, the one that costs five thousand USD. I'll give you the spec tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but but anyway, thanks thanks, uh, Prof. Yazid, for sharing the session. And uh, thank you for introducing uh, Professor Langdon to me and uh, to our distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Jean Viv uh, Langdon. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for the great uh, session. And thank you for entertaining all the questions from our audience. And to all our audience out there, thank you so very much for watching this uh, distinguished lecture series. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.